podcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Gala webinar series. My name is Manuela Noska, and I'm the communications manager here at Gala. Gala is a global nonprofit trade association supporting the language industry. We're headquartered in Seattle, Washington, in the United States. And today we're going to have a presentation by Sören Eberhardt. And we're so pleased each of you joined us from various locations all around the world to participate in the event. I will hand it over to Sören in just one moment, but first I have a few housekeeping items to go over. We have muted everyone's lines to cut down on any background noise. If you experience any technical difficulties, you can let me know by using your chat box and I will work with you to troubleshoot them. If you have a slow internet connection, your audio may be disrupted. If that happens, you can use the number listed on the GoToWebinar panel to call in using your own phone. We are making a recording of this presentation and you will be able to find it following the presentation on GALA's global website. All participants will receive a link. If you have any questions for the presenter, feel free to type them into your chat box throughout the webinar to get them into the queue. We will get to as many questions as we can with the time remaining at the end uh, of the session. Also, please be aware that our webinar series is taking a break in the month of August. We will continue with our webinars in September, kicking it off with a sponsored webinar on Thursday, August 6, uh, September 6. Details will be announced in the next week or two and you will receive notification through the usual channels. Before we begin, I'd like to take just a few moments to introduce our speaker today. Sören Eberhard is a senior program manager in the Skype localization team at Microsoft. He has been working in the field of internationalization and localization for over 20 years, both on the vendor and client side and in different roles. As a translator, a localization engineer, and as a project manager as well. He has taught localization classes at the University of Washington and CAD tools at New York University. The language with the few speakers he has ever localized the product for is Inuktitut, and as we all know, that is spoken in Nunavut, Canada. So now, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Zören for the remainder of the session. Zören, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, and thanks to everybody attending or um, listening to the broadcast cast later. Um, yes, I'm, I'm going to talk about community localization. Um, Thanks for your interest in the topic. Um, let me quickly see that I can actually move forward. Uh, yes, I can. Um, so the, uh, the agenda is, is very straightforward. I basically have, um, I'm, I'm planning on answering these four questions. Um, why doing community localization? That uh, sounds like a silly question, but uh, you really need to be very clear about the, the purpose um, clarifying that. Um, I hope that, that I can help with that. Um, the what, meaning both the, the um, scope within your products, not also the language set, then who is doing the work, so who's that actual community, and then the how, so looking at both processes and tools that can be employed. And before I get started talking about community localization, um, I want to clarify the terminology a little bit. I'm referring to community localization as working with a managed community. So people that you build a relationship with and that community can be, can be really, really big. That um, when you look at Facebook, for example, they're doing community localization. They have um, obviously very, very big user base, but uh, they're managing them because it's uh, managed through their user authentication. Um, crowdsourcing would be more the anonymous giving work um, to, to people you don't uh, necessarily build a, build a relationship with. Now, the term crowdsourcing is actually surprisingly young. Uh, it was just introduced in 2005 and it was um, used both for community localization and for forms of, of gig work as well a few years back and, and seemed to be um, a good answer for, for people not directly involved in, in localization for saving costs. And that actually leads me to the first question about um, the why 
doing community localization. Um, if people assume that community localization could just replace your current forms of, of translation, um, you might first think about how much you have to invest in actually building a community, um, giving them a tool that they can use for the, for the different things that you want them to do. And so community localization doesn't come for free. When you look at the current models um, that are being employed in, in the localization industry for translation, you have a lot of recycling going on. You very often have post-editing of machine translation. It's not that translation is um, extremely costly. If you're replacing that with community, you still, as I said, you have to replace um, maybe your, your current platform with a simpler one. Um, community might not be able to use um, some of the industry tools. Uh, for simplicity's reasons. So um, you really have to look at how much money would you really save if you just shifted all your translation work to a community. So um, having community localization with a purpose of cost saving might not be the, the best approach. I think there's three areas um, where the why of community localization is a lot more powerful. So the first one would be increasing the quality of of your translations, um, either through review um, or original translation by the community. Um, and quality would be really just measured by what is it that the market expects from you. If you have the market being involved with users who contribute to the community, uh, to the, yeah, who contribute in, in the community. So the second one might be that you want to increase the reach um, of, of a product by um, adding languages that you would not normally add. So um, that would not be um, saving money on those, on those languages. You would normally just not, not go for them. And there are some communities who are heavily lobbying to get um, products localized into their language. There are some, some language activists um, so a while, while back, I was involved in uh, the language interface pack effort um, that, that uh, Microsoft drove for Windows and, and Office, where we did a lot of minority languages. And there were people that, that really um, that lobbied to have Microsoft or Google um, products localize the languages like Maori or the Cherokee Nation here in the United States has been very active lobbying for, for getting their products localized. So those languages might be might be one of the targets. And I, I will talk about that a little, little later um, again. So um, and then the third purpose um, is when you build a vibrant community, you can really increase the attachment of your users to your product. So if people are actively involved in giving feedback, they feel closer um, to your brand. And so uh, you, can, you can grow the fan base of your, of your products. There's quite a few, few products um, where people are very actively involved. And uh, so they actually also help growing the community just um, because they're very passionate about having a specific product in their language. They want others to be, to be helping as well. And so uh, that is basically a side effect of, of the two other things where you get work done. Um, you also build, build that relationship of users to your product. So um, I've already touched on, on a lot of this. What, is, what are the areas in which you can engage the, the community? So for reviews, you can just have linguistic reviews. And in general, you can just have, have people give feedback on existing translations, which uh, is a simple first step. Um, when you're already out there with localized products um, involving the community in one form or another, um, having them, them give feedback on your general translation quality, but then maybe more concrete on individual strings that have been localized. Um, you can also go for um, just specific terminology, so you don't go for full strings, but um, you have your, your critical terms. I will show a few examples um, from the time when, when Microsoft was uh, doing quite a bit of that during our, our big language expansion phase. Um, and then reviews can also be very useful um, when it comes to technical accuracy. So there are certain areas where that is needed a lot more than, than for others. For consumer products, you might not need this. But uh, for developer products, for example, you might have people very passionate about, about their language. Um, 
and have the technical domain expertise. And so uh, they could help out. The translators might not always be that um, experienced in that particular domain, um, like certain, um, certain developer products, IT admin products as well, where you have people that, that can give you that. Um, for, for translation, uh, which would be kind of the next, the next step, so giving people strings that haven't been translated yet, um, you can go for the, for the product itself, so the user interface and um, as well the content. And for both, uh, both things, um, you can of course have, uh, if there's machine translation, you could just have them, them post edit strings, so there, there are models there where um, Microsoft, for example, has, has used that people augmenting machine translated um, help topics um, for certain languages and um, yeah, post editing goes and improving the quality there. Um, so first talking about the reviews, um, really getting very concrete language quality feedback is, is fairly rare uh, from what we have seen. Um, we have quite a few feedback channels, um, both on the Skype localization team at Microsoft, but, but, uh, as well as at Microsoft at large. But um, for a lot of products, people will get feedback on features first before they focus on a translation error. And for those translation errors, it's normally something that is really standing out that, that people will complain. So we, of course, we all know we've seen these customer escalations um, where there's something that, that was really very obvious that people complain about. But uh, getting more feedback, maybe just slight improvements, users normally don't take the time unless you really ask them to do so. And so um, that's why establishing that, uh, establishing specific channels to that, to which the users can give that feedback very quickly is, is um, really important. Um, yeah, for the Skype localization team, we've actually, we've been doing internal reviews. We had our reviewers um, and, and um, got a lot of improvements out of that, but uh, we can never be sure how well one, two, three reviewers actually reflect the overall market. So the more people you can get involved, the better. Yes, I already talked about new languages. Um, so just from, from my team's perspective, um, adding any language uh, um, is, is costly and it's risky to add a language for which you're not sure whether it really makes sense from an ROI perspective. You don't wanna take away a language. There are cases where languages are being discontinued because the usage is so low, but um, it's something that markets normally don't take uh, too well and um, your subsidiaries might not, not take too well. So um, as I mentioned, there, there are certain language communities where there's a lot of lobbying, um, but where you as from a business perspective would say, it doesn't really make too much sense um, to add these, these languages. Um, if you give your users a way to then contribute those translations by themselves, uh, it's a it's a win-win for, for everybody. So uh, yeah, this is an example actually um, for, for a while, um, during the time when before Skype uh, got uh, merged into into Microsoft, uh, there were these um, community projects. The Skype architecture has changed, so we cannot provide the same opportunity to our users um, anymore. But uh, people built these these language packs by themselves, so there were translation projects um, that people started themselves. So they self-organized and and created these basically language packs um, that you could. You could just uh, download from this from this site, and uh, we see some of uh, some some really exotic uh, languages here that um, were never on on the official on the official official list of of languages to be to be localized, um, not even on a multi year roadmap. Um, you see Sardinian or or Scots, and those were um, pretty well maintained. So. Um, there's definitely people who want to have 
have a product in 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 their language and if you give them the opportunity they will um they will probably come and and help you out um so that already answers a little bit of the of the what um you basically have to decide which languages are you going for um when you do reviews do you have specific specific languages that have very high usage you should probably start with those then you might scale across your whole language sets really depending on how many languages you have overall um i would always recommend to to start your community efforts with a few languages so that you can see how well scalable your efforts will actually be um if you have a set of apps, products, um, which ones can you really offer to the community to be, to be localized? Um, there's, there's certain products for which um, it might, might be recommendable to, to keep them completely in-house um, and you might not need a whole lot of, of community feedback or not want, want it. Um, and then you can even decide how much do you want to have localized or reviewed for for each app. Do you really want to give people everything? Are there certain, um, for example, I mean, it's a very simple case, but legal documents you would not have um, reviewed by a community. Um, there's legal terminology and then and the whole leakage parlance. So that would be something you would automatically exclude, but um, are there specific pieces of an, of an app that you would leave out besides that? Um, we've actually, found that uh, in our in our piloting phases for for community um, translation and reviews that uh, people don't really like to review super short strings often because um, if you have menu items if you have short buttons those are normally the strings where there's already an established standard terminology that your users will probably not really ask about unless you ask them for for uh, reviewing core terms, but uh, in many cases, you have these, these short strings that are very straightforward and um, users don't really feel they can be creative. If, the, if you give them a full sentence um, or you give them strings um, with, with even more than one sentence, longer, longer strings, uh, people feel they can actually improve them, improve them more. So you might want to look at what is it really that you want to get, get feedback on. So now let's move on to uh, the, the people doing the work. So um, I will talk a little bit about roles and then also um, the whole trust question. Um, let's start with the, with the roles. Um, and this is, you can, can argue about the terminology here, but um, we've, we've identified a few particular um, conceptual roles. So the first one would be people who do the translation work. If you uh, allow people to, to translate, who there, there should be a role obviously for people suggest, should, suggesting translations. Um, and um, obviously for that, you need people with, a, with the right language skills. Um, you could separate the role of a reviewer, uh, just people reviewing things. So you could have those people not even speak the source language, um, although I'm not sure whether that's really a feasible concept. Um, and in most cases, you would probably have the role and the translator as the same. Um, and when you look at the tools, um, they're basically separated because you often have voting mechanisms. So there would be a reviewer uh, role-oriented feature while the translation field would be a translator um, translator related feature. Um, for most communities, you will also have a separate role of somebody who has the linguistic expertise and is outside of the community to look at um, either verify, validate strings, um, look at least at possibly offensive strings, maybe do sample reviews, maybe do a full review. Um, for that, you need to have somebody who's um, outside the community that can be somebody who originally comes from the community who you somehow promoted to that um, moderator role. Uh, you could, of course, have freelancers for that, or you can have your traditional LSP uh, provide people for that. Um, but really, people have a little more of the linguistic expertise to be able to judge what's coming from the community. And that ties in with the whole trust question. Um, we separated out just conceptually that role of an ambassador. Um, so people who help promote the 
community and obviously uh, the more of your translators and reviewers have that role as well, the better, the faster you can grow the community. And then you will have somebody who actively manages the community and uh, you might even split out a project manager is just responsible for setting up those community projects um, and somebody who engages with the community. And they can be somebody in-house or um, it can be so in, inside your own company or it can be could be also done uh, by somebody who provides other localization services to you. So how do you get uh, your community first, um, really depending on your on your app, you will need to identify uh, specific target groups. Um, there's some some groups um, depending on on the product. I've, I've listed gamers, developers here. Um, there's some that um, I've mentioned before, like language activists. So so people who are already very passionate about having things. Um, localized into a given given language. You might tie in your community localization work with um, beta releases or the concept of insiders as, as um, Windows, for example, at Microsoft has it. Um, so those people could, could be your first, first line of um, feedback givers. And um, so there's there's all these different um, different groups that you could could tackle. Um, you will need to go to these potential community members through the uh, channels and platforms that they are using. Um, certain areas, like for example, for language activists, you might really engage with specific organizations. Uh, there might be some some communities out there um, already. And your company might even have certain communities. Um, if you have a better program, for example, there might be already all those, those better testers organized in some way. Um, there are forums, user groups, and then obviously social media. You can do a lot of reaching out through, through that. You can have your tweets and Facebook postings and so on. So um, I mentioned trust. Um, that obviously is, is always a problem when you're reaching a bigger community. And the bigger the community is, the more contributions you will get. So there's this, this balance of um, how do you control that? So if, uh, if um, you manage your community actively, um, you have your basically your first, your first floodgate could be just vetting people before they get started with translation. That will slow down the onboarding. So you need to balance the ease of how people get into your community with um, how much vetting you want to do. But uh, you could, for example, do a very simple language test just to make sure that, that people really meet that, that minimum requirement of, of understanding the language. Um, or you can have more depth in vetting. Um, sometimes the community is obviously um, have more built in trust from your end anyway. So if it's an existing, um, existing community of, of users, um, you might have already had certain certain mechanisms, or it's just the, the group of people, um, our colleagues at uh, Cloud and Enterprise, for example, they're working with people that we call uh, uh, MVPs, most valuable professionals, that um, mostly partners that, that work with, with Microsoft, and uh, there's a lot less of that trust than for big consumer product. Um, we did um, when we're doing things for Skype, um, we have a lot more potential people giving feedback of which we don't know whether they might sneak in uh, one or two bad translations. And so um, having a system that enables um, you or your users to find uh, bad translations um, is, is pretty important when you have a bigger community. So give other users the uh, possibility to identify bad strings and, and report them. So just having a very simple reporting mechanism. And then the moderator um, that I mentioned, if you have that moderator role, you could determine how much um, they vet. And um, you can also have a scoring system for your translations. And uh, as the whole organization industry moves more into artificial intelligence and machine learning. There will probably some eventually be, be systems that will help in a much more automated way of checking um, 
checking the um, value of translations and, and score them automatically. But uh, for now, you might need to do some of that with some manual algorithms. And actually, that's what, what our team has, has done. I won't give you the secret sauce, but uh, we are looking at um, how well people have been, have been doing with a, with a particular score on the back end. Um, so, so you already don't, don't trust the community fully. We also need to think about um, consequences of bad behavior. Um, you don't want to be too harsh, just excluding somebody from the, com from the community without any, any communication might not really be useful. They might come back on a different account. So um, you should probably communicate to them what happened and, and why. Um, and you might just not give them translations for this project. Uh, that they've been working on or um, just make sure that uh, they understand that they've entered an offensive term. Um, just need to clarify that um, while, you're, while you're building your translation process. So attracting, growing, retaining the community, um, it has to be pretty easy to onboard for a community member. And when they are on your community platform, about which I will, will um, talk in a little bit, um, they need to have a really good experience with that. So it needs to be simple to use, and they also need to have some documentation um, that supports them with their, with their tasks and makes it easy for them um, to, to accomplish what they want to accomplish. Um, you will need to rely on, on certain network effects, but obviously you also need to have a lot of communication through different channels to attract more community members and um, grow, it, uh, grow it quickly. And then you will need to maintain your community. And uh, there are lots of different ways of, of addressing that. Um, you will really need to think about what product you have localized by which, by, by what kind of people, what's in it for them. Um, often some sort of gamification helps. So I have this, this little screenshot here, just shows that's a conceptual screenshot that um, we looked at and seeing kind of um, having a point system or badges um, for, for um, people. Obviously when you have anything like that, you will need to make sure that um, you have a gamification, but people cannot game your system because when you give people points, they might also think about how can, how can they get the points easily if you associate um, real, real rewards for that. Um, so you need to be aware of that. Um, you can have events, specific activities. Um, so you um, can even bring in um, members of the community for, for a little conference, um, really depending on, on your budget and how much you get out of the community, just maintaining the interest. Um, there needs to be some sort of moderation. So um, the whole trust question is not only one uh, that affects yourself, but also um, the community itself. If people feel there's lots of really bad contributions, um, so make sure that the community still uh, still respects the the, um, the contributions of others, and then finally, an important one: you should try to close the loop. When people give you feedback, can you let them know that that feedback was taken, or uh, if it was rejected, what were the reasons for that? Um, so for people just reviewing strings, voting on strings, and then never hearing back what happened with that with that work. Um, it's always frustrating if you just, you work and you never hear about the results of that. Um, so um, if you have a mechanism that, that tells people, uh, yes, you've suggested so and so many strings and so and so many strings um, out of those were actually implemented in our user interface. Um, it's something that makes people feel, feel a lot more valued. Um, so this is this is an example. Um, it's nine years ago, so LinkedIn at the time um, they are uh, irked people by asking for for help by professional translators, um, and it might have been just the wrong community, or um, it might be um, while well, they might not have found the the right way of addressing that community at that that point in time. Um, 
So now let's talk about the, the how, so the actual workflow uh, for translation and or review and the processes and tools. Um, and for tools, there's, um, there's different ones, um, the unstructured ones, um, and then um, dedicated ones. So let's talk about unstructured. So this is um, my dear uh, co-workers at, in, in office, um, of this localization team. Um, they started with the LinkedIn group. We've, uh, they've since moved this to, um, to the office community pages, tech community, um, but this is still being maintained. So this is basically, um, it's not a tool. It's basically using a group to ask specific questions and get feedback. And they've gotten quite a bit of, of um, feedback on the, on the translation. So basically it was a very unstructured review where people would come back with um, with issues. Uh, but that obviously requires quite a bit of, of manual overhead. And that's basically the first way of establishing a good feedback channel with a given given community that you can can actively manage on I mean, a LinkedIn LinkedIn group. You can see the members and um, you can um, contact them directly and so on. Um, so this is an an easy easy platform to use, um, but it doesn't have that that structure that you might might want to have um, in a dedicated tool. So for the dedicated tool, are you looking for something that you internally develop or an externally provided solution? Just briefly mentioning, and I don't have any affiliation with Transifex. Um, just mentioning that as a as an example, if you want to check it out, um, they have a translation editor. Um, they have the whole project management. They can show you how many streams have been um, translated by the community. But obviously, you need to pay for their services. So um, you would have to look at, um, would it make more sense to uh, build or further develop an internal tool, or do we want to go externally and leverage existing solutions um, and pay, pay license fees there? Um, when you look at either developing a tool or utilizing one that's out there on the market, you will need to look at both your needs and the needs of the community. So the needs of the community are um, pretty straightforward. The tool needs to be simple. You don't have the professional translators that are used to certain industry standard tools that know how, know your expectations a lot better. Um, they don't want to invest a whole lot of time in learning how to use a tool. Professional translator for them, uh, especially if they keep working on a project with you, um, they will take that, that steeper learning curve if they know that there's uh, more work in for them in the long, long term. Uh, the users, they want to come in, they want to give feedback on a few translations. So uh, make, it, make it simple. Um, for software, the best solution is probably if you have something where people can give feedback directly in context or they can review in context of the, so if, if you can give them the software and they could make the changes right there, that would be probably the preferable solution. Um, my colleagues in, in Windows have been working on something where you can very easily give, give feedback right on the, on the Windows interface. Uh, so that's, that's a great solution because people see things in context. If you just give them strings, you will need to have some additional context that you provide to them, some commenting. Uh, that's what we've been um, doing for, for the Skype localization team. So then looking at your needs, you will obviously need to make sure that you can extract the strings easily from your repos and um, give them to people. And so what does your localization infrastructure look like? Um, how does it integrate with a community localization tool? That workflow, you will need to answer that question and really make sure that uh, it's not only flowing out of your localization um, infrastructure, but also flowing back in fairly seamlessly. Um, and you don't get too much manual overhead on those connection points. So just a very few examples, because I'm seeing that we're, um, I wanna leave a little time for, for questions um, in the end. Um, so um, Microsoft has, has used quite a few different platforms. So we had these Microsoft terminology community forums, where basically just gave people the opportunity to vote on um, specific terms. 
And we did that mostly during a time where Microsoft expanded its language portfolio quite a bit, um, say like um, mid early 2000s. Um, so this is an example for Hausa, um, where people could vote. Um, so there was always a translation suggested already and then people could vote. And it went so far, so from in Nepali actually, um, um, and that's where the manual work comes in again. Um, people had, um, a, a newspaper worked with us and they published about a dozen terms every every day um, and had people give feedback um, and uh, then we would um, get that that list of suggested term translations back from them. So I've already mentioned um, Facebook. If you want to look at an example for community localization, that's a very, very simple one where uh, different strings are being offered. And you can see some of the some of the core concepts here. There would be different translations, um, and also the opportunity for you to add a translation, and then um, a voting voting mechanism. Um, so, um, and I'll talk a little bit about our um, our concepts a little a little more. Um, this is Google. It's even even simpler. You just get a string, an English string, and then you can add your source, uh, your, your translation to that. So you don't have a voting mechanism, you don't have anything offered. Um, what is stronger here is uh, the gamification. So you see the, the badges here. Um, I'm not doing so well. I've only offered, only given two, two translations, obviously. Um, and so this is uh, the example. Um, we actually just had the alpha release um, this week for the Microsoft localization community um, being utilized by Skype. Um, this has been created in um, cooperation between Bing, CNE, and Skype teams. Cloud and Enterprise has been has been using that with uh, smaller developer communities already. Um, and Skype is rolling it out, and uh, so a very simple experience. You have to either sign in if you're already registered, or you have to sign up um, and give very minimal information and. Um, obviously also agreed to some legal requirements. Um, and then um, you will see this, this surface where, um, where you have um, different strings, a list of strings that you can, can localize. And I will actually zoom into this, this weight area, which is basically for one, for one string. Uh, so the key com components here are comments, giving a little bit more, uh, information because we're just giving them giving them strings um, and don't show them where they show up. Uh, it would be, of course, nice to have screenshots. So if you can develop a tool uh, where the string is shown in even more context, even better. Uh, term reference, that's something we're working on, um, having integration with the terminology database. Um, so that's something you might want to think about as well. What's that integration, either an existing tool or, or one if, if you want to build one. Uh, the source string uh, right above the suggestions. Um, and in this case, we only have one suggestion that's actually even English, but uh, this is from, from our piloting phase. Um, and then you see the buttons here, um, a, a voting button, and you would see how many people else have voted uh, for this particular version. And you would see more than that one existing um, translation, obviously. Um, and then after the voting button, you see this, this little um, copy button, which would enable you to copy a translation into the field below um, so that you can edit that easily. Or you can just um, write something from scratch in that, um, in that field um, and then click Suggest. And then to the very right, um, next to the existing suggestions, you have a button for reporting offensive offensive strings. So I've already mentioned that um, giving your users um, the possibility to basically self-police the community a little bit and, and say, hey. Um, and we do actually have mechanisms that also check for, for things additionally to this. But uh, if, uh, if you have a well-working community, people can point things out themselves if they find them in the, in the suggestions. So the, the translation and review workflow um, is very, very straightforward. So you have a source string uh, that we actually, we would use auto translation and machine translation if you have that capability. 
Um, it's always, always great. So even if you use an external platform, can you run things through machine translation? So you already have one suggestion. Now, what we found is that having some sort of seeding translations always helps, even if the translation is bad, um, even if you have just a recycled string that is a little off um, or you have machine translation, um, people are more keen to, to give feedback if they don't just look at an, at an empty string. So even if you're just asking for translations, um, having translations that people can work off, even if they're not the best, um, that, that helps speed up the process. And then um, you send your source string plus the, those suggestions, um, plus, a, plus a comment in the, into that um, user interface that uses so, so the translator would translate that string and then the reviewers can vote for, or they suggest a new one. So if they suggest a new one, you have basically you forking. Um, so you get more translations for one source string, you get more uh, translation units, so to speak. Um, and obviously there's then more people can vote on that one as well. And then the translation, when meeting certain criteria, it would go into a stage where it's getting validated and or reviewed um, and the validation might be some of those standard checks that, if it, um, that you use anyways. You might check for integrity of placeholders, things like that. Um, and uh, review, you might have your, your moderator look at all strings, as I said, or, or possibly just a few. And then you have the final string and that should go back into your overall localization infrastructure. So when I'm talking about criteria that a string needs to meet, um, in many cases, you don't you don't just want to have a string just because somebody translated go back into the system right away. Um, you might want to have a translation out there for a little bit so that you can gather more than one one translation suggestion. Um, it's not that in this case first come first serve um, might not work so well. You might want to have input from from more people. That's why you have a community after all. So um, you might want to define one of the criteria might be looking at the length of time uh maybe a string has to stay for five days or for 10 days um or for several weeks whatever uh you might want to also look at the number of votes that a translation got so um maybe you have a certain threshold there and then you might even have a more complicated score and that's what i was talking about um that probably eventually um some sort of artificial intelligence um being instilled there might might really help with better scoring systems. Um, and it might need to reach that threshold to even get to the point where you have a moderator look at it because um, you would probably have, in many cases, you might have somebody who's being paid for, for that moderation. So when talking about tooling, the last piece that you might want to think about in terms of tooling is also, can you automate some of your communications? Um, because um, acknowledging um, people helping you, there will always be that uh, just sending out broadcasting communication, but um, for the personalization, personalized communications, um, you might wanna have certain templates that are being triggered. Um, somebody, after they submitted their first translation, you might automatically send them an email, hey, thank you, um, after 25, um translations w whatever your thresholds are or you also send something out for people who haven't been active or they have registered for the community but then uh they never send in a translation so there's lots of ways that you can think about what sort of triggers would you want to have um so you would also need to think about the intelligence built in the back end um that you need for that so it's monitoring how many um translations are being suggested by a person, how many votes, um, yeah, length of being registered, uh, time of last activity, and so on. So, um, and talking about data, um, there's obviously uh, certain metrics that you will need for defining the success of um, your community localization. And um, it would be, uh, just a tangible result, so number of translations or reviewed strings, um, whatever quality issues uh, were identified during the reviews. Um, so you can you can measure that uh, and then normalize it against the number of community members and 
and so on. Um, and then when I was talking about the, the third purpose, kind of how much do you engage people, those would be more social engagement, uh, social media engagement or sentiment um, measures where you look at how much do people interact with the platform, do they talk about it in social media and so on. So um, there are some of those metrics that would really measure your users user's engagement. Um, and that's, um, that's it um, for my presentation. So uh, say clarify what you want to achieve, uh, make really clear to yourself what, is, what are the, the main purposes, um, and then define the scope for community localization well, have a plan for building and retaining it, uh, the community, uh, look at the tool, and uh, definitely define your, your metrics. Okay, with that, I'll open the floor for questions. Thank I you. Open the floor Thank to you, Manuela. <laughs> Thanks, Erin, for the overview. This was really interesting. Um, we do have a bit of time for some questions. Um, so let me kick it off with this one here. Uh, are there any specific strings that you would not give to a community to translate or review? You mentioned legal earlier. <clears throat> Any other domains that you think should be completely out of bounds? Um, I would say that um, it, um, so for strings, it's not necessarily a domain. It might also be that, um, for example, if you have strings um, with lots of placeholders, for example, of course you can give people the instructions on how to handle those. But there might be strings that are just very complicated um, to to translate or strings with a lot of formatting tags um, that that stay in there in your localization infrastructure. So there's always the question: How much can people people break? And we know that regular translators are already um, can can break strings. Um, and I would be careful with a with the community there. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and then certain certain domains, as you mentioned. Um, Legal, legal translations is definitely one of those, but there might be also privacy. So a lot of those um, of texts that um, have very regulated terminology where you have to be very, very clear. Um, yeah, um, something that might have geopolitical impact, like country, region, list, language names, things like that, I would recommend not giving to the community. Mm -hmm. You might have interesting feedback, but uh, you might not be able to tell people that you implemented anything. Great. So a follow-up question would be, how do you identify those complex strings? Uh, and how do you secure or ensure, you know, consistency in tone and style if you take certain strings out of the, out of the community look project? So for the... Um, Yes, consistency of, of tone and style, um, that is always something that's pretty pretty challenging. Um, so what we've been doing is recommending to our community that they should take a look at, at the strings uh, in, in full before they start suggesting new, new translations and, and voting for existing uh, translation suggestions so that they get a, get a feel for it. Um, obviously, the better people know your product, the, the better they will also know the style, but it is something that you cannot guarantee. People might use one term in one string and then they review a few other ones and then they just on the fly change the terminology. Uh, that's not avoidable. So that's where you're looking at what's coming back from the community becomes important. Um, and that really depends on your quality requirements. Yeah. Um, and then we have a question here. Um, about you know if you have any estimate about uh, how crowdsourcing affects uh, reducing production time or increasing throughput uh, any uh, any insight there anything that you've learned does it really reduce production time does it uh, increase throughput um, what have you experienced Sorry. In terms of agility, um, so we've we've started building our program. We have not, um, so I, we've basically decided strategically that we have a very good turnaround time for translations with our existing language uh, localization service provider. Um, we will not be as agile with the community. You cannot expect people who do that on the side um, to give you strings back very quickly. Um, so we've basically said um, those 
strings that we give to to people will always lag behind. But we don't have we don't have any numbers yet um, because we really haven't pushed for short time frames. We've given people ample time. And it's something uh, in most cases I would say, yeah, I pointed out the whole cost saving side of things um, that you might not get a whole lot of cost savings. You will also lose agility if you're using a uh, community. Normally um, people who volunteer for, for work will not be as fast. Uh, and that actually leads me to one one addition um, that I've, I haven't mentioned that when you, um, because this question also, the, the, the crowdsourcing. So um, if you think about community localization, maybe it's only one piece, maybe also looking at, at gig economy and you really want to give strings to people that are being paid. I talked about the unpaid community, but that might be another tool consideration that you might want to keep in mind. How would a community um, engagement effort, some sort of platform, how would that tie in with a possible um, gig economy platform where you give translations to people, but then instead of them volunteering their work, um, you would need to pay them. So that that sort of integration, I, I did not touch in mm -hmm. touch on. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we have a, a question that um, follows up on that as well, and that is, have you uh, or has your team ever tried to use money as an incentive or a driver for the community? No, we've uh, well, we've given out um, coupons, well, um, yeah, vouchers, um, gift cards, basically uh, equivalent equivalent to money. Uh, when you start really, when you start giving out money, that would be um, you're, you're basically getting into into gig economy, and then you really have to think about labor laws. I mm -hmm. very briefly passed on that during the sign-in process, um, the sign-up process, uh, that there are certain legal requirements. So first, there is the whole copyright question. Basically, you need to ask your users to give up their intellectual property for their suggestions. That is a very simple one that's pretty straightforward and internationally not that um, not that difficult. But as soon as you pay people for the work that they do in the community, you might get in conflict with labor laws of 190 plus countries. Uh, so that is something where you need to treat, tread very, very carefully. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks for that. <clears throat> we have another question here, um, and that is around the, the term community. And this person is wondering if that is nowadays used in the localization industry as a, a, a synonym for vendors. So does the community actually, re uh, is, the com um, is the community represented by vendors? What's your your sense there? Um, so that's, um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I feel we're talking quite a bit about um, uh, gig economy and yeah, more crowdsourcing here. Um, like a vendor could help you if you really wanted to crowdsource to get those resources to you. Um, a vendor could also help you with getting community, but uh, the community model that I was presenting, kind of where you really build build a community, you could have an an LSP help you out with building that, but uh, it should be people who want to contribute by themselves. So um, I don't see that as an equivalent. I don't see vendor and community as in any form of synonyms. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I think we have time for one more question and, and let's use this one here. What's, uh, what are the differences uh, in communities? You know, would you expect higher quality from certain communities than from others? Yes, I would, and that really depends on the on the target audience. Um, as I said, if you have people who are very invested, um, and I mean, you could even build community models where uh, eventually people could advertise that they've done all these contributions. So, depending on the visibility of your of your platform, um, people might even say, "Hey, I've translated in this project." Um, there's if if the reputation is really really strong for a given given platform. Um, so it might be platform dependent, it might be dependent on yeah, the, the sort of community I mentioned that like if you have these these professionals that I have a high interest in, in saying, hey, I've, I've worked on this and you, you even call them out by name as contributors for a certain project, uh, there would be higher quality there. And then you might also have market differences. So we've seen that at the time for the um, terminology forums that some markets were super eager to give feedback and other markets were very reluctant. Um, and 
Um, since there were a lot of new markets where we had never done that and we didn't track it over time, it's kind of hard to, um, to, to say that it's a, a general rule which markets might be less prone to giving feedback. But uh, it's just something that you should be aware of, that um, there might be, might be certain language communities where you get a lot more feedback than others. Um, yeah, that's, uh, I, I would say it really depends on, on the case, but uh, uh, there's definitely the differences in what quality you, you can expect. Yes. Thank you so much, Søren, for this overview. It's been great. Um, and thank you to the audience for all the, the great questions that you've posed. Um, I think we're going to call it quits at this point. Um, but, uh, you know, we would really appreciate it if you could take just a minute to give us your feedback on today's session using the post-event survey. It is very short, but it really helps us uh, to continue to refine our webinar program. Um, and so with that, I wish you all a good day or a good night, depending on where you are. And I look forward to seeing you at the next Gala webinar, which will be in September. Talk to you all then. Bye-bye.